from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Robin Reed will go over the just-announced details of the USDA's Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, which is providing financial aid to you agricultural producers who've been hurt economically by the pandemic. She'll talk about what commodities qualify for aid payments and the payment rates that have been determined for each. Also, K-State's Eric D. Wolf and Kelsey Anderson will advise you wheat growers to be scouting now for stripe rust disease, as the critical point for fungicide treatment is imminent. And awaiting with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. All that and more coming right up on Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Thanks for tuning in for our midweek edition of Agriculture Today. Well, the eagerly awaited details on the USDA's Coronavirus Food Assistance Program were released just yesterday, midday, and this is of high importance to producers who are eligible for assistance through the USDA in the wake of the economic troubles that have been brought to bear by the COVID-19 situation. Joining us now is Robin Reed, agricultural economist with K-State Research and Extension. Robin has been pouring through the details of that rather voluminous announcement on the CFAP aid, as they're calling it for short. Let's start with this, Robin. Sign up for this aid, this program, is very soon, is it not? Yeah, sign up for this actually starts the Tuesday after Memorial Day, so May 26th. But it runs through August 28th. So there's a lot of time to get in and sign up for this. And I use the term get into the office and sign up. That's not really possible at this point. All of our FSA offices are working virtually. So it'll be a call and make an appointment, virtual appointment kind of thing. But yes, sign up starts on Tuesday next week. But just know there's going to be a a lot of interest in this program. And it's not a first come, first serve Everybody will be able to get their payments, so don't worry if you don't make an appointment right away. There'll be plenty of time to get in and sign up for these payments. And point well taken because local FSA personnel are just now learning about this program as well, so it may behoove you to actually wait for a bit of time to let the dust settle, if you will, on these details. Yes, I would agree, Eric. You know, everybody's still kind of processing how this is going to work and what some of the finer details will be. But we do know the basics of how your payment will be calculated and what you can expect as direct assistance. Well, let's pass along those very basics. Noting, first of all, this will be a single payment from two sources. Could you explain, Robin? Yeah. And when you look at the website and you know, look at the payment rates. It's a little confusing. So what happened here, there's actually two programs that are being combined into one payment. So the CARES Act provided $9.5 billion in relief for producers um, that were partially to compensate for the loss in price decline between January and April. And then the CCC Charter Act also put in $6.5 billion. That's to compensate producers for ongoing market disruptions and assist in that transition to a more ordinary marketing system during this COVID-19 pandemic. So in total, there's $16 billion, but it's actually two different sources. So that's why you're going to see different payment rates. One for what happened back in January to April and one for mid-April to mid-May. And as folks would sign up and qualify, they'll only receive a portion of their payment initially. It's it's the lion's share, but not 100%. Right. So when they 
calculate their payments now, they're only going to get 80% of their calculated payment. The final 20% will be issued at a later time determined by the secretary to the extent that funds are available. But just know that they can't go over $16 billion. So that's why they're making sure to just pay 80% now and make sure everybody gets paid so the money would not run out. That's put out there then. Let's talk about particulars. First of all, what we'd call non-specialty crops, maybe traditional crops would be appropriate as well here. What are the ground rules and the rates they're working with? Sure. So what they call non-specialty crops or what we're calling traditional crops here in Kansas would include corn, sorghum, soybeans, sunflowers, and you know our, our normal crops. One thing you're not going to see in there is winter wheat. So winter wheat did not have the 5% decline that these other crops did that kicked in a payment. So how they calculated these declines was looked at the weekly average futures market price for January 13th through 17th and compared that to April 6th through 9th. So the futures market decline between mid-January and mid-April determined what the loss was for each of these commodities. And then producers are going to be paid a rate based on how much on-priced inventory they had as of January 15th, 2020. Now, I'm going to emphasize that again, on-priced inventory. So what they had in storage that was still subject to market price risk. And that cannot exceed 50% of their 2019 production. So most producers would have more than 50% of last year's production marketed by mid-January. So really, most producers can think of this as what they had on hand that is subject to price risk as of January 15th, 2020. And you might cite in brief here the rates to be paid for the lead crops corn, grain, sorghum, and soybeans. What do those numbers look like? Sure. So there's actually two payment rates, as I kind of explained there, where the CARES Act has a payment rate and the CCC Charter Act has a payment rate. So just an example here for corn. The CARES Act is paying $0.32 per bushel, and that's, again, on 50% of the corn that you had on hand January 15th. And then the CCC Charter Act will be paying 35 cents per bushel on 50% of that corn that you had on hand January 15th. So you can really think of this as if you combine those two payment rates, that'd be 67 cents per bushel. You'll get paid 67 cents per bushel based on 50% of the corn that you had on hand subject to price risk on January 15th. Some of our other crops um, here in Kansas, soybeans, The CARES Act has a 45 cent payment rate, CCC 50 cent payment rate. So that combined would be a 95 cent per bushel payment rate. Sorghum, similar to corn, 30 cents on the CARES Act, 32 cents on CCC. So that's a 62 cent per bushel payment rate. And of course, all of that information will be spelled out on the agmanager.info website. And let's talk of the assistance available to livestock producers under the CFAP. This is structured a bit differently vis-a-vis crops, of course. Yes, and livestock's the one that we know has been hit real hard um, just with uh, everything going on around COVID-19. We'll start with cattle. So there's a CARES Act rate for cattle sold between January 15th and April 15th. And that's broken into feeder cattle less than 600 pounds, feeder cattle more than 600 pounds, fed cattle, mature cattle, and then any other cattle. So, for example, feeder cattle 600 pounds or more, it'd be $139 per head that the CARES Act would be paying for anything sold between January 15th and April 15th. For fed cattle, that's $214 per head. Now, the Part 2 payment, so the CCC payment, is for unpriced cattle inventory between April 16th and May 14th. So this is a much lower rate, and it's the same rate across all cattle types. It's $33 a head. And again, that's the CCC portion of the payment 
which is on price cattle inventory between April 16th and May 14th. And of course, hogs and pigs are covered here as well, Robin. Yep. And it's kind of the same structure there, the CARES Act. So for pigs less than 120 pounds, it's $28 for head. For hogs, 120 pounds or more, it's $18 a head. And that is animals that were sold between January 15th and April 15th. Anything on price that's in inventory between April 16th and May 14th is $17 a head. Robin, if one would like more details and an opportunity to have their questions answered about this assistance as it's been freshly announced, you and colleagues at K-State Agricultural Economics, along with cooperators from the Farm Service Agency, are putting on a webinar this coming Friday morning to allow for all of that. Yes, Eric. So we are going to do a webinar this Friday morning at 9 o'clock. So that would be May 22nd. And we'll be going through all these details. I know it's a little hard to understand when you first hear the numbers, but seeing it all and having it explained, it it is fairly simple. It's just a little confusing that there's two different programs wrapped up into one payment. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be walking through that. The Kansas State FSA office will be on to talk about some of the details of getting signed up for these programs. So please visit agmanager.info under our events page. You will have to register for that webinar. And another good place, if you just want to see the information, go to farmers.gov slash CFAP. That's the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Again, though, if you'd like to take in that webinar and have your questions addressed on this assistance, do check it out at agmanager.info and register for it. It is set for this coming Friday. That'll start at 9 o'clock in the morning, and the FSA and K-State Agriculture Economics teaming up to put that on. Well, Robin, thanks for going through all of this with us. Appreciate your time, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Eric. Robin Reed with us, K-State Research and Extension Agricultural Economist, on the USDA's newly announced Coronavirus Food Assistance Program for Agricultural Producers. You're listening to Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Keeping your distance from others is important in slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are some fun things to do alone. Read a book, take a walk, unpack your suitcase from that trip you took last September, paint a self-portrait, catch up on a TV series, do a puzzle. Remember, we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're tuned into the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. You wheat producers are due an update on disease issues and concerns in the crop out there and what, if any, response you might want to take on here in defending your crop. Joining us once again is plant pathologist Eric D. Wolf of K-State and along with him, the newly appointed research and extension wheat disease specialist here at the university, Kelsey Anderson. And before we go any further, Eric, would you do the honors in telling us about Kelsey's arrival? Sure. Kelsey Anderson is our new extension wheat disease specialist for the university, and and we're really thrilled to have her join our department. Kelsey comes with a lot of great experience that she brings uh, uh, to the Kansas producers, both in wheat and many other crops. And I think uh, you're really going to enjoy getting to know Kelsey over the years. And we're going to introduce her right here. Kelsey, welcome to K-State, first of all. And just to let folks know a bit about you and your background in the area of wheat disease research, tell us about yourself. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. And I'm happy to be here. Uh, Thanks, Dr. DeWolf, for the nice introduction. So I got my PhD actually at University of Florida. So I came here from Florida. Before that, I worked in private industry. So I was working for a company that was Monsanto, is now Bayer in their soybean breeding program, but also working with corn and wheat pathology there. And I have my master's degree in plant pathology from Ohio State, where I worked on a disease that should be familiar to wheat growers, Fusarium head blight. Um, And we thought a lot there about how rainfall patterns affect um, management of the disease and also fungicide applications. So So I'm really happy to be here today. If you are going to miss Dr. DeWolf, don't worry. He's not going anywhere. 
So he will still be uh, in the background working really hard on the research aspect of things and we'll be working collaboratively together. So I'm looking forward to that. And you've both been out and about in Kansas recently, getting caught up on what's happening in field. And we'll start with what, Eric, seems to be the most prevalent disease issue at the moment, stripe rust. I think so, Kelsey. What do you think? It seems like uh, we've been out seeing a a lot of different diseases out there, and and it seems like stripe rust is on the move. What do you think about the prospects of, of stripe rust and where have we been seeing it in the state? Sure. Yeah, at least through the last month, I think you're right. It's been particularly bad in southern Kansas. We've seen it move up into in central Kansas into the mid canopy and the upper canopy, which is when we start to worry about stripe rust. And even last week, we were out scouting in um, north central Kansas in Jewel County and found some stripe rust just starting on the upper leaves. So that's when um, you start to worry about stripe rust impacting a field when there's a lot of plants that are in affected and it's affecting the upper leaves of the plant. Um, and that's when we start thinking about about making a management decision about applying a fungicide, right? Maybe Eric can tell us a little bit more about making that decision. Yeah, absolutely. So when stripe rust does move from the mid canopy to the upper leaves, like Kelsey's indicating, that's uh, when we do start to get concerned about potential yield loss from stripe rust. So remember that the, the upper leaves, we call them the flag leaves, Uh, contribute somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the yield potential of the crop. So anything that damages those flag leaves uh, has the potential to uh, to hurt our yields. The treatment options here, uh, we need to kind of think through a a couple different things. We might consider a fungicide if we have a susceptible variety and and some good yield potential out there yet. Remember that uh, we can apply a fungicide to protect those upper leaves anytime, usually between flag leaf emergence. We'd like to have that uh, collar or ligule of that last leaf fully out, but then we can go through the heading and even into the flowering stages of growth for many of our fungicides. So as we were out looking this last week in, in central Kansas, I think we're right at that critical growth stage for many wheat producers in the state. Uh, maybe into the the boot heading or or even flowering stages of growth for for many fields. So uh, it's really important that growers be out looking uh, this year as well. And uh, right now is the critical time to make your final evaluations and decisions about uh, whether you need a fungicide or whether it's warranted or, or needed this year. And it gets back to, and Eric, we've talked about this many a time over the years, and Kelsey, you can chime in as well, to the economics of treatment and knowing whether that treatment is worthwhile vis-a-vis the value of the crop. And sometimes that can be a difficult call, can it not, Kelsey? Definitely. So it depends a lot on um, on what the price of the grain is at the current moment and what you think the potential yield of the crop is. So it's a balanced decisions um, and how bad yield loss is going to be. What other diseases are in the field? So if there are some viral diseases in the field that are affecting the crop and there, there's some other damage, maybe from early season freeze, maybe the value of adding that input of a fungicide might not outweigh the cost of the input. So that's important to make that a decision on a farm by farm basis. So stripe rust is out there, but there's another pathogen concern that has both of your attentions. This is right in your wheelhouse, Kelsey. It's uh, Fusarium head blight or head scab potential is picked up. And you mentioned it earlier that you've done work in this arena. So you're seeing signs of that possibility out there as well? Yeah. So for Fusarium head blight, there's Unlike stripe rust, which can affect the crop throughout the season, fusarium head blight has this critical window when it can affect wheat, and that's when the wheat is flowering. So this is the time right now in Kansas where the wheat is susceptible to this fungal pathogen. And so it's really the time when the decision can be made to apply a fungicide or not. Same same, like the discussion we were just talking about. And for fusarium head blight, unlike for stripe rust, you can't really see it happening until it's already too late, right? So the symptoms don't show up until three weeks after that infection time. So it's important to protect that flower. Fusarium head blight comes with the additional risk of a toxin, deoxynovalanol, a mycotoxin, which can accumulate in grain. So not only does it um, make the grain smaller and shriveled up, but it also can can cause us toxin production. So it's something we have to be really careful about. 
And I guess over these last couple of weeks, the weather conditions, especially in South and South Central Kansas, have been particularly good for fusarium head blight development. So the fields that would be at particular risk, check your variety, the the rating guide, and see if you have a susceptible variety. So those would be the ones that would be a particular concern. And then also crops that are wheat on wheat or wheat on corn in um, low or no-till situations might be at higher risk because that's where the, this particular fungus will survive. And Eric, for historical context here, we've seen head scab before in the state. Is is it setting up to be something of a usual outbreak in the state or because it's been wet in several parts of Kansas, notably, as Kelsey says, South Central and especially Southeast, is it more acute a problem this year, do you think? Yeah, well, like Kelsey indicated, we're, this is really the critical time, growth stage-wise, and we're, we're trying to get a, a feel for what's going on. We are concerned about the weather pattern that seems to be occurring in the southeast, south-central portion of the state. Uh, so I would say, you know, historically, as we look at the southeast, they're probably uh, most at risk. It seems like uh, they uh, uh, will have a problem with this in, in many years, maybe Five out of 10, seven out of 10 years, they might have at least some level of fusarium head blight or head scab to deal with. As we move into the central portion of the state, the, the disease is less common there. And uh, it's only when we get these really favorable rain periods or uh, extended periods of high relative humidity. There, that portion of the state, it might be two out of 10 years or three out of 10 years where it seems like uh, we have elevated levels of fusarium head blight. So you know, it's uh, there's a lot of growing season yet to, to come here, and we'll see what happens. But uh, we wanted to at least get the word out to let people know that it, it looks like there's a, an elevated risk of, of having some problems with this disease this year. All right. I want to squeeze in one more possibility, and it's an old familiar foe as well, wheat streak mosaic. And you suggest, the two of you, that that might be afoot likewise. Kelsey? Yep. So we... We were out scouting last week, especially, and then we've heard a lot of reports from central Kansas and some from western Kansas that weed streak mosaic virus is at high incidence in some fields. So that's an important thing to scout for. You can see some streaking on the leaves, but also some yellowing at the tips. And the thing about weed streak mosaic virus is it can sometimes be confused with other viruses like barley yellow dwarf viruses, or, or there's kind of a suite of, of viruses that can affect wheat. So we do have a disease diagnostic clinic that we want to just give a little shout out to um, in the plant pathology department in Manhattan that can run a very quick test to determine which virus um, is present in the field. And, and that can help make some future management decisions like maybe what variety to plant next year, things like that. So, so just a reminder that that service is available. Don't forget that the Plant Disease Diagnostic Laboratory is indeed open for business. And if you'd like to access it, you can go through your local Extension Agricultural agent. That's one avenue there. So, Eric, you've successfully passed the baton. And uh, we appreciate both of you being along with us. And, and we will talk again, Kelsey, very soon about what else might be happening in the late stages of our wheat crop in as far as disease concerns. Thanks to the both of you, and we'll talk again soon. Great. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Eric. Along with plant pathologist Eric D. Wolf of K-State, the new research and extension wheat disease specialist at the university, Kelsey Anderson. And we'll be back with more. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. On now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, wheat crop scouts zoomed in on the Kansas wheat crop yesterday, pardon the pun, in the first day of the 2020 hard winter wheat virtual tour 
Day one found a highly variable crop in northwest and north central portions of the state. The vice president of research and operations for Kansas wheat, Aaron Harries, said that the yield estimates in the north central region ranged from 25.6 to 59.4 bushels per acre. The average yield estimate at just uh, over 41 bushels. The estimated yield range for northwest Kansas was 20 to 117 bushels per acre. The average estimate then of 51.7 bushels. This year, Kansas wheat has teamed up with certified crop advisors, extension agents, elevators, farmers, and others to pull wheat samples across the state. And the assessment of those physical samples is then being virtually presented each evening with the final yield estimate scheduled for tomorrow. Estimated yield potential calculated using the formula provided by USDA NAS this year. Uh, For the past 50 years, of course, the Wheat Quality Council has conducted the wheat tour of the state with a caravan of scouts making several hundred stops each day. Harry has said that this year's tour was rapidly put together to respond to it being derailed by COVID-19. They'll have much fewer samples, but will lean heavier on seasoned scouts. And K-State agronomists gave detailed evaluations of what they were seeing. The agronomist in the Sunflower Extension District in northwest Kansas, Jeannie Falk-Jones, noted that the northwest part of the state had a wide variety of wheat conditions, most of the stress seen coming from the drought and freeze damage. As Jeannie said, quoting here, April was rough on wheat. However, she also noted that fall conditions did set up those rough conditions. They did not have good fall growth, poor root development. Many fields could have been improved with better moisture management from the start, she added. And short, thin stands not unusual across the region. Jeannie mentioned concerns these areas could see weed pressure prior to harvest. And K-State wheat production specialist Romulo Lolato, of course, involved in the tour. He said if he had to pick one thing that was taking the toll on the wheat crop in north-central Kansas, where he scouted yesterday, it would be drought stress, with north-central Kansas five inches or so behind where they should be in a normal year precipitation. The drought also accentuated the freeze damage, according to Romulo. He noted that the extreme cold was hard on tillers. He showed a picture of a field out of Osborne County in north-central Kansas with trapped heads from freeze damage. Early tillers killed by the freeze also common. Now, side reports from the tour from Colorado and Nebraska also reflected a struggling wheat crop. The executive director of Colorado, Wheat Brad Urker, said that current estimates in that state put abandonment at 25 percent. That figure could climb higher if drought continues to widen. He gave an average yield estimate of 32.5 bushels per acre on a harvest of 1.7 million acres for Colorado. And the executive director of the Nebraska Wheat Board, Royce Shanneman, reported a crop that's very short of stature in that state. He said early estimates pegged the Nebraska crop at 50.8 bushels for a 42 million bushel total, but that he believes the actual numbers may be closer to 41.5 million as producers decide some tillers that looked good earlier won't make. Today, the tour heads to west central and southwest Kansas. And it's worth noting right here that K-State will be hosting that live virtual wheat field day, and that is set for a week from this evening, May the 27th, and the evening of Thursday, May the 28th. Uh, This will be on YouTube to update you growers and others on the most recent crop advances and challenges. K-State's Romulo Lolato is coordinating this. It'll be two field evenings, beginning at 7 o'clock in the evening, ending at 9 o'clock Wednesday and Thursday. Thursday of next week. We're looking forward to that program. It will be quite unique and quite informative. If you'd like to know more about being part of it, taking it in, you can contact Romolo at lolato at ksu.edu, lolato at ksu.edu. Well, because we're devoting the bulk of tomorrow's program to a full look at the just-released Kansas Net Farm Income Report from the Kansas Farm Management Association, we bring you the Kansas Soybean Update a day early. Here's Greg Akagi. Doug Bounds, Kansas State Statistician for USDA's National Ag Statistics Service, joins us. 
Doug, we're in the heart of fall crop planting season, and so how are we doing with regards to soybean planting in Kansas? Well, Greg, soybean planting in Kansas is coming along pretty good. Um, as of May 17th, soybean planting in Kansas was 37%. So if we compare that to last year, we were only at 14%. Or if we look at the five-year average, um, we were at 22%. So we've come along pretty good. Um, we've made pretty good progress since last week when we were only at 23%. So that's about a 14% jump week over week. And we've got several reports coming up, but probably the next big report, Doug, will be on June 30th when USDA's acreage and grain stocks report will be released. And what's some of the data that will go into that report? So the acreage report that comes out um, will have all the plantings that happened this spring, and then it will have some updated wheat numbers, of course. Back in March, we forecast soybean plantings to be right at 5 million acres in the state. So what we'll do now in June is we'll collect that data again from a few more operations, and we'll find out whether or not those intentions have changed any based on how the world has changed in the last couple of months. And then on top of that, we have the grain stocks report. Um, We'll go to, we'll get information from the farms as well as grain elevators across the state, and we'll see how many soybeans are stored in both on and off farm throughout Kansas. So for the acreage report, will some producers get contacted by NAS to get some of their numbers? Yeah, we will go to a little over 4,000 crop farms in Kansas during the first two weeks of June to collect planting information so that we can put together a solid number in that acreage report on June 30th. And to remind all producers across the state, NAS has suspended all face-to-face data collection due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we will only be contacting producers by phone, mail, or email. If possible, we ask all producers to respond online. That's the fastest and cheapest way to respond. Um, If they can't do that, by mail is the next cheapest way. But if they get a phone call, then please respond that way, and that will make life better for just about everybody involved. All right, Doug, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. That is Doug Bounds, Kansas State Statistician for USDA's National Ag Statistics Service, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. Greg Akagi there. And we'll be back shortly on Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. The least they could have done is ask. And I would have said no. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. A senior student friend called the other day and asked if he could borrow my crowbar. He was digging a ditch and there was a lot of rock in his way. He knew I had a crowbar because a few years ago he and my daughter helped me build a short section fence after I cleared a totally overgrown corner of the property here on the hill. It was a corner where cedars grew close together, their branches were broken and vines and briars had taken over. It was a mess. Only deer could and did slip through. The day I decided to clean it up, I started with a roaring chainsaw at the outer edge and just persisted, making cuts and dragging out. Ultimately, I pulled all the stuff to the brush pile, a huge pile, and burned it later. By clearing, I added an interesting corner where I found a corner pin, proving I still was on my own ground. Once I could walk into the corner, I saw that there was an old wire gate going to what once was a grazing hill, and now my built-on-neighbor's property, separated from ours by the old fallen-down stone wall. As the clear trails follow a section of the old wall, I often look at the boulders and just admire the work, 
the hard work of collecting and clearing the meadow, the hauling, and then the careful laying of the stone. Some of the stones are fascinating because of their shape and character. They're nearly all limestone. Some are huge. I've pulled a few out and used them as decoration. I've given some away. What peeves me is the people who live below me have taken from the old wall to build their own wall. For some people what is mine is also thine. The least they could have done is ask, and I would have said no. I did find one packet nest where I had been clearing. I left it. It's far enough away from the house not to bother me. And as much as I dislike the animal, I do admire its industriousness. It can haul big sticks and build its nest. It reminds me of the beaver, only the beaver is much bigger, and the beaver builds dams as well as his lodge. When I finally had cleared the far corner of my property and had cleaned and trimmed up my rough chainsaw cuts, I could see daylight come through the trees, and a small vista was opened up. It was a surprise with a view across and along my neighbor's property. Over the next weeks, I kept walking to my clean corner and decided to close the rock wall gap with a lean-on fence built of rugged cedar. I cut a few sturdy cedars down to use as posts. Then I looked for two tall, slender cedars to use as rails. No need to slip the rails. Nothing would ever again go through what once was a gate. I needed three sturdy posts. One post was the existing old but still strong corner post. I only had to dig two holes. As a place to shovel into the ground, I hid on rock and more rock. And that is where my crowbars came in. And the welcome help. There was my daughter and Richard, the student. My daughter knew what crowbars are. I don't think Richard really knew that too. I know he did not know the old-fashioned post hole digger. Two handles attached to two scoops, and the sound goes clap, clap, as you work the post hole digger, lift the full scoop, and then empty it. You set it down, and grab the crowbar, and pry loose the rocks. I have two crowbars, a short one, five feet tall, with a sharp point. It looks like a very heavy spear. I used to be able to handle it with ease. It is a great tool to loosen up the center of a hole. Then I would use the other one, which had a broad flat tip, and pry on the side of the hole. When enough loose soil and rock was prized loose, I would grab the post hole digger and clean the hole out. Repeat the process until the hole was three feet deep, sometimes deeper depending on the function of the post. A corner post always goes deeper. The old Osage corner post holding the barbed wire along the stone wall is still standing strong. I didn't use it. It's part of the line. The wall is on my side of the property, according to the old deed. The old post is hard as rock. There's no way to drive a nail into it. I showed Richard how to use the postal digging and the crowbars to his advantage, using leverage as well as weight and his strength. I chuckled when Richard studied the mechanism of the postal digging. He was a quick learner and dug two good holes, two feet deep, a little bit deeper. That was deep enough for a rail fence nailed together on which the old man would only lean to look across the fence. It's a very quiet corner. The deer trails run to it and they jump it. I've taken deer hair from the poles where they slip through. With holes deep enough, posts stamped in well, 
and rails nailed on, it's a strong structure in a neat and quiet corner. I nailed a birdhouse to one of the cedars with opening to the light and small grassy meadow. It might appeal to a bluebird family. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. And our time is away for today. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.